Well, welcome to the journey. Uh, we have, uh, this is the first time in, in, you know, I think coming up on four years that we have actually had a, a guest back to back. So last weekend we had Dr. Uh, Terrence Lichtenwald with us and he was beginning um, and to tell us about uh, a lot of his uh, work that he did as a forensic psychologist and the backstory of, of when uh, Dr. Lichtenwald um, was recruited uh, to become a forensic psychologist. Uh, he was also spending time as a school psychologist a, a, as well. And so today in part two, we're going to take a deeper dive into what is um, some of his work with white collar crime and then the specific work when white collar crime turns red or turns into uh, violence and murder. So, uh, uh, Terry, uh, Dr. Lichtenwald, it's great to have you back on the show. And um, and it feels like this week has been has gone by really quickly. Um, but uh, I know that's the nature of how things uh, how things are. But uh, I know last time we started with uh, what is, uh, what does Terry do for fun? Um, mm -hmm. and I know after reflecting on that, you, you, a couple more things came to mind. So what, what do you do for fun when you have some spare time? Okay. They, and they originated from my California experiences. Uh, okay. the first was, um, because the, all of my classmates were so certain I would come back to the Midwest and just drink beer, eat cheese, maybe brats. And that was it. They took me, uh, to the wineries. And I actually got to meet people that make wine. And I started to drink wines, uh, little bits. So I can tell the difference between a Sauvignon Blanc, a Red Zinfandel, uh, a Pinot Noir. Just, um, and they actually, they, they were just insistent that I not drink beer all the time. Um, uh, that because you know we it, actually they didn't even know in Wisconsin it's brandy but I didn't tell them that right and the <laughs> next thing was I loved uh seafood they took me uh to the ocean to go fishing so uh in, in addition to the taking me out for hang gliding taking me out surfing they took me out on a fishing boat and I caught fresh fish from the ocean then they fillet it you take it home and then you uh, you grill it. So I love seafood. I just learned it. And then um, hot tubs. Wherever I was, they have hot tubs uh, all year long. So when I could get the money and I lived in Rockford, um, I got a great hot tub, and a spa. I said, I know the difference between a hot tub and a spa. And that's what, uh, and it was big enough for the whole family. Nice. And I loved it, especially in the wintertime. Yeah. You know. Uh, it's it's fantastic, you know. So it's interesting. Uh, probably 13, 14 years ago, uh, that was one of the things that Diane and I invested in was was a hot tub, and we use it all year round. And uh, and 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 sometimes, you know, well, not sometimes. Our favorite time is when it's either a cool uh, fall night or when the snow is coming down. That light, big flakes coming yes. down. Those are those are perfect times to be in the hot tub. Yes, I. Uh, the California people are truly missing the good experience of sitting on a in a hot tub during a snow, uh, light snowstorm. So, yep, yep, exactly. Uh, the, the other thing I, I I I wanted to say is, for fun, I have met fantastic people, uh, many criminal uh, attorneys that practice criminal law, and the way I worked it was. Um, well, two is Frank Perry, who will be talking a lot about his work today. And the other one was Wendell Coates, C-O-A-T-E-S, Wendell. And he was my friend. I was in Rockford, what, 34 years? So maybe at least 25, 30 of those years. Uh, and he uh, was always calm. No matter, Attorney Coates, he's always, all he ever said was, uh, oh, my. And so, you know, it's like something happened and involved a hatchet, and, and you know, and he's like, oh my, and, you know, that's, so you want to be around the top lawyers, the top judges, people, judges who are wicked smart, but kind, they run that courtroom, but they don't have to, you know, it's, they don't have to power thrust. They, sure, you know, sure. And yeah. just some fantastic judges. I just, uh, and so that was important. And then, of course, my friends from the government who helped me 
all these years, but always made sure I had referrals. And when I wanted to do my research, they were, everybody knew Terry Lickwall wants to write an article. And every agency knew Terry Lickwall is going to ask you, hey, can I write an article on this? And they always pretty much say no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but eventually, uh, we were able to get, get the red collar, stand up the red collar crime stuff and get her going. So, and that's from Frank, Frank. Frank Perry. Well, let's yeah, go so ahead. And, yeah, let's let's go ahead and jump into that. And 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 when, from a broad standpoint, when when we use these terms of white collar crime, you know, um, and and so maybe kind of start there with us. Kind of differentiate between when we think of crime, and from a from a from a violent standpoint, or when we think of the stereotypical criminal, and then differentiate that between what is referred to as white collar crime and and how is that different how do we how do we tell the difference well one of the articles i sent you is very very important there's a famous uh i think he was like i would call him a sociologist uh and his name was sutherland and we wrote an article sutherland cleckley a famous psychiatrist and beyond white collar crime and psychiatry. so back in the 1930s they used to believe that if you were a banker, doctor, lawyer, a high status individual, uh, a minister, uh, that you could not commit crime. That the high status people in society don't commit crime. That was their, that's how it was way, 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 way back. Um, so Sutherland went to work. Now, there was a lot of vicious academic stuff and careers he destroyed, you know, people lost careers, but he had a way of wanting to work uh, and it did not involve data collection. What, I, what I'm doing, what Frank is doing with the Perry's Matrix, he did not approve of at all. He, he, would, he would choke off our funding. Um, now, I, I understand why this was, you know, maybe why I only did five years at the medical school, the academia stuff for both of us, man, it's not, it's, it's, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's vicious. So, but Sutherland is key because he gets the ball rolling that, Hey, we need to start looking at everybody. And then he finds out that, well, the white color people, uh, they are supposedly what they call nonviolent, but really it's, it's, it's death. It's a delayed death. Because once they steal your money, and like say you have a, a, a child who is diabetic and you can't afford to buy the insulin, there is violence attached to the taking of the money. You lose your house, you're homeless, you can't find or buy food, you can't afford a car. Uh, that's the price, but they call it nonviolent because you just get sick and die later. You, it's not death, at the, it, it didn't break your leg. Okay, you, you died of uh, 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 not being able to control your blood sugar later. Okay. Sure. So they don't see it. They they oh, they they keep it very, separate. very and, and, separate. And what do you think now, looking back on that work, and what do you think was the the motivation of having that mindset that uh, professionals, uh, high high, you know. Uh, upper echelon royalty what, whatever it may be either royalty uh, from mm -hmm. like europe royalty or like in in the united states we have you know people by position not by family right or or you know by role and so what do you think was the the foundation or the motivation between keeping that separate or or saying that no this type of this class of individuals are above that Yes, I think I think you nailed it right there. Going back to the old time, if if I can say the Chicago style social worker that looks at the whole uh, social spectrum, looks at the what what's socially. Wait a minute, why are certain people in certain houses? Why why do we have poverty? Looking at that, that's that is hardcore American because we're like, hey, no, 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 no. We, we, you know, we're striving to have a level playing field. And we got information here that says it's not level. So, 
that's the hardcore back in the day when and and uh yeah yeah you're a doctor but i'll tell you what or you're a lawyer we just saw that big case uh frank sent you the article where they interviewed him on uh the guy from was that uh georgia uh shot his uh his uh child and his and his spouse yeah that was three four generations deep yeah, only in america man we're going to have a trial <laughs> And yeah. that's how that's going to go. Yeah. So that's, that's, I think that's what that yeah. was about. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, and, and then as time went on, uh, they started developing databases for other, for like bombers. There's a database I, I had access to. So like, if you're a bomb maker making bombs, there's a, I, I know a lot about bomb makers, arsonists. I know a lot about arsonists, database on arsonists different types of arson and stuff like that. Murderers, databases on that stuff. White collar crime, not so much. So the, we lost 60 years of hardcore data gathering uh, because of, I think this, the, the, the criminal, criminology people or sociology department uh, felt that it was only for them. And really forensics, man, like accountants, psychologists, psychiatrists, just about everyone. You have worked with criminal thinking going to the jail and the prisons. Yep. You know, it's all hands on deck, like Frank says, or all all hands rowing, Frank Perry. So so now we 60 years later, we're just developing the the database system for the white collar criminals. Well, and speaking of that, I know we mentioned that in the first the first episode about the idea of uh, criminal thinking um, mindset, right? And and that when it was first introduced to me in the early '90s, when I was you know working with uh, working with addiction work as well as then starting as a school social worker. And they were differentiating at that time between students that were what they referred to as maladjusted versus mm -hmm. students that qualified for special ed through emotional disturbance. Right. And back then they still had uh, on the at the state level behavior disordered, emotionally disturbed students, and at the federal level it was severely emotionally disturbed. And right. um, so there was a there was a separation. And I worked with um, Randy Zimmerman, who was yes, a, me too. The, the head he's psychologist. Hear me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's a great guy, great guy. And he was the yeah. really the one who introduced that. And then there was this overlap. He was teaching me that regarding school and, and the mal, maladaptive student versus the uh, emotionally disturbed student. But very quickly, I saw how this was applying to what I was doing at Oakwood and yeah. what I was doing at, doing at ATEP. Those were the two, you know, Oakwood was the psychiatric hospital we worked at. And then ATEP was the treatment facility at Rafa Memorial Hospital uh, for substance abuse. And mm -hmm. so then it was the idea of addict, um, addictive thinking patterns and criminal thinking patterns were very similar. It just happened to be uh, the mind, the thinking patterns were same but the subject matter was more uh, more about substance or addiction, or it was about uh, uh, criminal behavior. And then we had irresponsible thinking patterns that they were right. all all the same, you know, in, in all the same direction, right? So, so if someone was uh, challenged, uh, there was this tendency to go into a victim stance was one of the thinking errors or be closed thinking regarding it. So they saw things from their right. perspective, but had a harder time with any levels of empathy of seeing it from other perspective. Um, right. and, and so there was the other, this yep, the theory of mind. Yep. yep. And, uh, and, and so I remember when, the, when I first was introduced to that, that was so helpful of going, so when people say, or when Kevin said, right, I don't understand what he was thinking. And then Randy would go, right, you don't, because you don't think that way. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think like him. So here, this is how he or how she's thinking. Tell me now what you think. And then I was like, oh, so I had to learn. So this yes. is what 
irresponsible thinking, uh, criminal thinking, uh, addictive thinking is. And then I would, I was able to see it through that lens. So it was, it was correct. That's, that's um, one of the big differences from clinical psych to forensic. I remember being at a meeting uh, when I worked for the government and, and some executive guy said something to the extent of, uh, you know, I was going through data, presenting data about what, you know, somebody had done. And, and he cried, he said, don't tell me what you think. Tell me what he thinks and what he's going to do. I was like, oh yeah. So I've got to walk over this bridge now and, 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 and really be able to articulate to other individuals very efficiently, quickly, uh, or in, at least in an organized manner. So many of them are lawyers who want to organize, you know, um, what this person's thinking. Yeah. Like you just said, what are his errors in thinking? Here they are. Here's his statements, his actual words he says that demonstrates that thinking error. Yeah. I'm giving it to you. So then whatever you guys do, you do, I don't know. And, and so yeah, when, absolutely. Yeah, when I started doing with my in my men's groups, which was a few years after I left um, doing direct addiction work, um, we I started using the phrase with with the men I was working with. And then I've carried it on to other individuals. But the idea of are what you're thinking slash then thinking about doing right the action follows that. Mm -hmm. Is it life giving or is it life taking? And in almost always in the light, in the, um, in the, the criminal thinker, right. It is, it, it's, it's beneficial for the host, <laughs> but it almost always is about taking from someone else in some capacity. Absolutely. Right on. And, and then blaming the person. I, that's one of the things that I, I remember some white collar criminals said to me, a group of them, there were anyways, cause I had to do with that but um they they like to say well you can't cheat an honest person well yes you can yes you can that's exactly what you're doing you are cheating an honest person and now you're blaming the person you cheated and saying that they're the cheat when you're the cheat my god and they and they just you know and so many people you know regular unless you're brought into this way of thinking um you know, the, it, on the Hollywood movies and all that, they always have the white collar criminal being kind of a lovable rogue type thing, you know. That's not the story. No. It is life taking, <laughs> not life giving. Yep. And and uh, and they hunt and they look for you. And and yeah, that yeah, that's Randy Zimmerman who hired me to come to the school district um, when Singer closed. Remember when the child oh, unit closed there? We used to have school there. Yep. And the adolescent unit closed. And uh, Rockford had these contracts with all these hospitals. That's where I was hired. And uh, and all the due process stuff. And I thought about that uh, since we talked. And you were with me one time. Mm -hmm. And you stayed remarkably calm uh, at the high school. I don't know if you even remember that, about the 504 issue. Oh, yeah. At Guilford. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and you, oh, well, I don't think, but you just said we'll take care of it later. It was a simple fix for a kid that had uh, some sort of a disability. Well, I can't remember whatever, but it was something. I think it was like get him a book or something. It was some. It was so simple, and they were not going to do it. And and oh my god, the fur was flying and feathers were everywhere, and it was like, yeah, we're going to do it. It's the right thing to do. Yeah, you just man. You know, it's a big life bolt. It pull everybody in. That's, but so, so yeah, that that Randy Zimmerman. That's why I got hired. Uh, there were tests that came out. I don't know if you use them in your practice. Or, I don't know, but the um, the justness inventory was revised, and that's the one that the kids take, and then you can match their thinking to specific counseling techniques. Mm -hmm. So are they more oppositional defiant type or are they more, you know, then, okay, then we've done research, you know, followed cases and these type of counseling techniques seem to work more with, a, a, is it more of a conduct disorder, a youth antisocial, you know, whatever. And yeah. so you can kind of try to match the thinking type 
with the type of intervention. And Randy was all about that. Yeah. That yeah. was that's how you make a difference, man. That's yeah. what you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, with a lot of this, as I was able to learn how to see things through this particular lens instead of because initially you you know, we have we either see everything through what we learn in school or we mm-hmm. see uh basically see see things through the lens of us walking life ourselves right through our own mm-hmm. personal experience and i and then obviously there's an aspect where there's a crossover but when randy was able to share that with me that was so much more helpful than anything that i had in in general had learned um wh- when i was in my different classes in school and um because we never dove deep enough into a subject matter to to be that that particular helpful and and that has been instrumental throughout my entire career i mean that's that was that was 30 years ago and and i still utilize that uh it just yeah. use different language but it's um it's it's the same premise so so terry when you know it's interesting you know historically right when we think of white collar crime being nonviolent or individuals you know that are professionals almost like a a classism and an aspect of classism yes. where where they they would that is not part of their character which then of course we we know today in 2023 that is not at all the case right i mean you know as as certain individuals if if they're a politician then they then they you know automatically have that and you know that i yeah. i know that is a uh, um you know, my my father was well known for saying that. Uh, he yeah. also, you know, during some fundamental young adult years for him, uh, we you know, grew up during the. Uh, he had me in '68, so that meant uh, when he was a young parent, uh, all the stuff with the civil rights in Vietnam and oh, yeah. President Nixon was going on, and so those were some of my earliest memories of my dad making commentary about what was going on in the political arena. Um, during that time period, knew nothing of what he was talking about, but I noticed that he was very animated um, yes. when, when when talking about it. So, so um, I just when when you were talking, I, one of the things uh, going back to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Academy, uh, uh, I had to read a book uh, called uh, "Games That Criminals Play," and Randy Zimmerman had a copy of that book. And, and I'm saying it now so your followers will know. Get it from Amazon. Don't buy it new. Get it from Amazon. Games that criminals play. And it, it shows you exactly how they manipulate you. Uh, because remember, that was the, 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 the bridge from clinical to forensic was so different. Like, I remember being in a lecture and they were now going to explain to me family structure. I thought, oh, gee, uh, I got seven years of family structure, you know, all the you know, uh, Virginia and the, 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 the guy. Anyways, turns out they got a whole bunch of men on a board with what looks like a family genogram and it's and it's organized crime. And I'm like, Jesus, you got you but you you shouldn't when you say family systems, <laughs> you know, but they, they interchange a lot of our work, our words are used in um in law enforcement, but boy, it's different. You know, it's not. You know, oh man. It, so. it's yeah, it, it, it yeah, it's it is interesting because, and again, going back to the white collar crime and, and and aspects of organized crime, but I was listening to a podcast this morning, and they were talking about this idea of of a family business, and if the family, the actual family structure is dysfunctional then right then then the family business is equally going to be dysfunctional it's just now it's going to be about a, a job of making money regarding that dysfunction and right. um and so it is interesting when you talk about the the term loosely used um family oh, yeah. and uh and how many different things that we associate that with yeah it's if everybody else in the room has had years of law enforcement and military and you know intelligence work and you're the only psychologist sitting in the in the Quonson hut while they're having this lecture. You're like, oh, you guys don't don't even use. We have totally different meaning for those words, you know. You know. 
But anyways, that, so yeah, Randy Zimmerman, uh, th that book was really important for your for your listeners, your followers. That would be very helpful. Uh, so Terry, if you can, if you could jump into uh, talking about this again, it's on a continuum, as we know, but the white collar crime and then the research that you've done regarding when it turns red, when it turns into murder. So maybe, maybe talk a little bit, talk about that. One of the things, there's a the first case. I, oh wait, I don't. I I have to be so respectful of what I can and can't say. Um, what ha, what at this point the data seems to support that the people overestimate how good they are at committing crime. So they think because they're able to take advantage of everyday normal God fearing people. Uh, why they must be just slicker than slick. So then they figure they can do murder too. Because, you know, look at how successful they are stealing from, from honest people. So uh, how hard can murder be? So they set out uh, a plan, uh, especially if somebody is, is going to uh, tell on them. See, that's the problem. Honest people are like, hey, well, I'm going to tell. You know, we're always going to tell. Well, I'm going to go tell the principal. I'm going to go tell mom. I'm going to go tell, you know, the cop. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go tell, man. You're going to get in trouble. <laughs> and these guys are like, no, I'm not. I'm going to take you out. I'm going to have you taken out. Or I'll do it myself. And uh, done is done. And that's, that's, the, that's their thinking. You know, so they make that transition to... Okay, you're a problem. I'm a problem solver. Uh, my moral code is, yeah, do what you got to do to keep myself uh, making the money, living the life. Yeah. So, so here, here's an interesting thing. Going back to the life-giving thinking versus life-taking or going back from criminal thinking versus non-criminal thinking, is what you just said. The honest, as you put it, the honest person, right? Let's say responsible thinker says, oh, okay, here's the information. If I expose what I have to you and go, oh, you can't be doing this. It's exposed now. Right. They, they think, right, that they would act like they do. Oh, gigs up. You know. Right. right. You know. They assume. And see, the thing you got, what I learned from white collar criminals is that I was I was walking across the parking lot one day, heading into a maximum security federal penitentiary. That's where my office was. And in the parking lot is where the white collar criminals were lining up because they have office jobs in, in the different zones. There's like green zone, a yellow zone, a red zone. Anyways, uh, and, and so I said, well, good, mor good morning, gentlemen. And this guy yells back, we're not gentlemen. We're not gentlemen. And I thought, you know what? That's the truth of it, isn't it? That's the truth of it. And what happens is, like you said, normal people think if I tell you this is wrong, we're not doing this, then obviously you're going to change. And no, you're not. No, you're not. And then then all of a sudden, everybody's wondering where the accountant went. Oh, they're at the bottom of the lake. Yeah. Fraud examiners have got... So, so, so I think that piece of it, right, is that, and we see this with uh, certain, um, with the work, and it's a different topic, but uh, with with certain types of personality disorders, right, that when when what the what the again using the idea of the responsible thinking you you say honest person does is going you know exposing them that the gigs up you know i have evidence you shouldn't be doing this or whatever now now that person knows someone else knows and mm -hmm. and and the fact that they um that 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 exposure instead of them saying okay gigs up i won't do that anymore or you know or i'll turn myself in or whatever it's no we're going to eliminate as you put it eliminate the problem and the problem is you're trying to expose me yes that's where i spent a lot of time uh you know with the with the smuggling the narcotic stuff and then eventually with what turns out to be human trafficking versus 
immigrant smuggling and all that. But that's the, they're always talking about uh, you either get the lead or you get the money. So if they can't deal with you through lead or money, then, then and that's you know the threat they'll pay you they'll they'll get you involved in the crime so that then you can't tell that's another thing that happens you know and that's the, and then the and then the, the criminal eventually does get caught then he turns you in for the crime you committed because he blackmailed you uh to commit the crime i mean you know it's just it's just a all the lives that are destroyed it's just well and to your you know to your point that we we hear about you know things being exposed about covering stuff up mm -hmm. and then what is usually utilized to cover it up well the incentive right. is money and right. and then and then once you accept the money now you're in on it yeah and, and 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 now 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 we're now we're partners in the same thing and and right. so so then the, then the fear is is that if you do anything then i will expose the fact that you accepted the bribe or accepted the right. you know, the whatever the hush money is or whatever you want whatever right and so so then the average non-criminal thinker now is they're, well, they're overwhelmed their head is swimming they yeah. cannot believe you have to you have to explain to them uh He's not your friend. Uh, you know, they 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 stole the, how, how many millions of dollars and you got 10,000. Hello. Hello. You, you you know, on visiting day, they're not coming to see you. you know? Yeah, yeah. You weren't actually partners. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh my God. So, yeah, so, so, so when you, so going along with that aspect for, for just, again, I want to make sure that our kind of our listeners get an idea that again, going from, you know, the early 1900s, where mm -hmm. we did not think individuals of certain class or certain profession would, would do a violent crime. Now there's this research that mm -hmm. has, has clearly shown, it's not just uh, speculation, it's clearly shown mm -hmm. that something that was now identified as a crime, which we call nonviolent white color crime, then at some point very much is at risk to slipping over into this red collar crime. Right. And, and so maybe share a little bit about that data and the patterns that they, that they've identified um, with that. Well, can, can I uh, share a screen, the Perry matrix? Sure. Is yep. that, okay. Um, okay. Now, can you uh, see that? Yep. Yep. Okay. Now here's what, here's what happened. Case number one is the Hansen case. So isn't that great? It puts Rockford once again on the map. Here's <laughs> here's the Hansen case. Um, and then at the time that this was done, there were 27 cases. I, I talked to Frank Perry last night, and he has 40 now, 40 cases. And what we're going to do is we're going to start collecting data and information because we're going to set it up like an actual experiment. Uh, well, eventually we want to do stats on it. And this is the type of stuff that Sutherland hated. So we can only use information that the court, that's available through the court. Uh, newspapers, court documents, stuff like that. My behavioral science study uh, and all the stuff I found can't be, can't be put in because it's, it's sealed. Does it make sense? Yeah. yeah. And the good lawyers, the good lawyers, the lawyers I wanted to associate with, they are deadly serious on this stuff. Boy, you just don't ever talk. You know, you don't, you just, no. But this is the stuff that's publicly available. And you can see we're starting to, uh, was there a weapon used? Well, you can start to see what the weapons were. Yeah, here's your basic, I think that's an ax. My vision is really yeah. going down. But you can see that the weapons and guns are used. Uh, place of the murder. Where is it, you know, do they take them out at home, in the office? You know, is it a public killing? You know, uh, how, how, how do they do, how do they do that? Um, and then you start, they're trying to look at the different types of white color crime they were in, uh, involved in as well. And here you can see the information and the data that's being collected. 
Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I think this is kind of interesting because I yep. think Frank sent you the stuff from uh, uh, Georgia, the case in Georgia. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Alex Madoff, Mad, I don't know, whatever. Right, yeah. Just had, okay. So here, remember they talk about shoe print evidence. Was there a plan? Now, here's this concept of overkill. And that's, that's um, o over the years, I took a lot of classes and and I was lucky enough to have like the, the people, the FBI people, they're retired and they're, they give a class. And they talk about how how they the terms they use, and you can often confuse overkill because you're thinking like overkill white collar criminals. That's when you can't like identify the face. It's really uh, lots of tissue damage, uh, blood splatter, and all that. And sometimes they think that that means that there's a close relationship or something, but sometimes it's just. Uh, and they think, well, then it can't be a white collar criminal because it was overkill. You know, a shotgun was used. Therefore, white collar, everybody knows white collar criminals prefer to poison people. And and they do. So they do. But um, yeah. yeah, so they do. So here are um, the data. I, I think if, the, if it's showing pretty good, then the people watching, yeah. the viewers watching this can see how a database is set up. This is a hard work. This is why um, there's not going to ever be like a, a television movie or TV show about forensic examiners doing court evaluations because it's this is this very, uh, it's almost count, you know, the, it's data collection from multiple sources, cross referencing multiple sources using multiple methods to find out these answers. You know, and then Sutherland would always say, well, you're not, you know, you're not including the person's history. Well, sure you are, because in the behavioral science world, one of the first things they taught me is that there's a thing called an NCIC, National Crime Information Center. Um, and it's like a baseball score. So you put in, they, when they put the person's name in, I get tattoos, everything. And then I get how many times you've been arrested for burglary. So it would say, Kevin's been arrested 12 times for burglary. And you go, wow, that's, you know, Kevin's gone, been convicted twice. You're like, wow, this is like, you know, when you're looking at the, 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 the justice system and you start seeing the scores. And then one of the things I learned is that I can always figure that you got away with it about 75% of the time. So if they said, uh, you know, nine burglaries, I should be thinking, well, this is going to be about 30, you know, and he's got it down to a science. He, you know, what type of burglary is it? Because, you know, when you listen to burglars, they'll, they'll tell you. So all the different ways that they do it, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. well, have that background information. Yeah. Well, I think you make a great point when you talk about like using that example of if he's been arrested 12 times, convicted twice, the odds are, right? Yeah. The prob the probability is that he's done 40 crime, 40 burglars, he only got caught you know, uh, uh, a percentage of that, you know, 25% uh, of it. And then the convictions are only on even a smaller percentage of those. And so kind of going, going with this idea of, of the first for the listeners to recognize that regardless if it's, you know, criminal, um, violent crime or white collar crime, in either case, the the thinking patterns are are the same. It's just right. that it's just that one is finding a way. Usually, it has a, a, a just a more uh, well. I shouldn't say more. There's a different a different way, a different means 
to committing the crime, to 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 doing the crime. And so um, it, it's kind of like, uh, is, is a person who's an alcoholic who drinks beer different than the alcoholic who drinks bourbon or vodka? Um, no, they're both alcoholic. They just find a different uh, a vehicle to get them there. It's, 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 it's the same damage. It's, it's similar. It's just that it's, uh, you know, it's just a different, a different substance to get to the same place. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. In fact, uh, you were talking about salmon all before. Um, and he has a book, I don't know if you've read it, uh, the, the myth of the out of character crime, the myth of the out of character crime, the boy that had that is they, that's something they teach you right off the bat um, is uh, you, there's a good chance you're going to be dealing with professionals. Uh, by professional, that means this is how they make a living. You know, this is what they do. So um, like this. Um, so, so I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and have you uh, go ahead and minimize this or, or, you know, kind of uh, stop sharing that for a second. And then um so, so Terry, as you were, as we're talking about this and as the research shares if and again, I know that your, uh, the, the, the majority of the work that you've done are, are looking, looking at individuals, providing data for someone as you, you know, are, are looking at patterns regarding that. But if you were able to give something to our, to our listeners about what could they do either one, if they are finding themselves you know, in a situation, because some of those, when I was looking at that last night and then looking at today, you know, some of them were over mortgages, right? right? That, that, that it, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, and, and any one of our listeners very well may, may be impacted by, you know, someone that is um, doing something illegal regarding mortgages either a banker oh yeah or, the predatory or... lending yeah man they yeah. they they took people down hard yeah. and there were good honest people that worked at those places that are supposed to check i can't think that there's a oh man it was two names um they just they i think they destroyed it uh, i don't want to say the wrong name and then and then some company gets mad but the, what they did is they just beat every working class person, uh, got their money, and then kicked them out of their house. And the people that worked in the mortgage thing, some of them were really good people, and they were shaken up to the core. And they started piecing together what, and then they had to leave a good paying job. But you see, then it's going to be the ladder of the money again. They're yeah. going to make sure you're not working nowhere else. They're going to make sure that your reputation is destroyed. You know, it's going to be all this character assassination, slander. And that's because uh, the company is just, you, you got a bunch of uh, thieves. And that, like I said, they, I mean, you know, they act like they're really hard, tough. They had a program, I'm trying to explain, but they had a program where they were going to try to have a step down. They were going to take people who were in real prison and they're going to step them down to the federal camp, you know, to get them kind of re-socialized, getting used to being out. And right away, there was an issue in the lunchroom. So if you walk around like you're a tough son of a gun, but you're a white collar criminal, and you back up against somebody who really is a tough, hard, stoic, has been screwed over by life so many times, uh, he'll take you out. You bump up against him in the lunchroom, and that's like a shark bumping a shark. And man, I lived that. I was in there. I'm telling you, it's on. I can't have you bump me because next time around, you're going to stick me. It's like a shark bumps and then comes around and bites. And so you had these campers. Camp, they're not even called inmates. They're called campers. These white call campers were freaked out about this guy. Uh, and I'm like, well, you know, I get along just fine with them. I don't, you know, I, I don't disrespect him. He's just here to do his time. Then he's leaving, you know, but the white collar criminal man, they, they're all, they think they're, you know, oh, you know, I'll get them later, you know. No, you won't. No, you won't. <laughs> you know, he sees you coming. He sees you. He yeah. sees you. Yeah. 
so yeah, for for regular people, yeah, it's hard now because um they can they can hit you so many times and they only have to get you once, you know, either by email or your phone. Um you know, I was told quite a while ago, I should always assume that my phone has been compromised, my computer has been compromised. You know, I paid for all that security. Uh, you know, I hired someone to do all the security in my business, but um, even he was like, look, you know, yeah, the, the stuff I look up, the stuff I, I had to do a big pedophile case uh, in, um, in a county close to where you are. And, um, and I had to learn, go to and learn a whole lot about Pornhub, Pornhub, never been Pornhub. Uh, wow. And so then my computer guy's like, uh, you know, he's putting up all these screens and stuff. And he's like, and I go, well, I mean, I, not only it's worse than that, I got to try to find out how much money they make, how they target people. Because they, they, this kid got, you know, it was, it was bad. It was bad. And uh, so, yeah, I assume he said, well, always assume that you're, even with all these safety checks and everything, don't ever give your credit card number over the phone. Don't, you know, if somebody says you got to fax money or get a run down and get a, um, whatever those were from the bank deposit what you know a check thing to yeah, set sure, sure, some, yeah. yeah to, to a relative real quick because he'd been in a car accident or something no yeah. no well and i think you know to your point as we as we look at kind of wrapping this episode up but i think similar right to the criminal thinking there's always going to be a sense of urgency right which, which will which will and and that sense of urgency is because you know playing on the honest person's mindset of being able to be helpful. And it has to happen right now. Kind of like, you know, going to buy something and, and that if you don't buy it now, it's going to, you know, it'll be gone. You won't, you'll miss it. And, and, you know, I can see you in this car. I think you would look great in this car. And this is the last one, the last one we have in the inventory is, you know, well, however that is, this urgency then comes on and then our, our fight or flight mechanism in our brain starts kicking in and then we don't think clearly. Right. And so yeah, next with thing the you know, affinity fraud type stuff that you see, uh, are you your brother's keeper? Remember the, the, uh, the, the, the trail where the person was hurt in the Bible and they you know, do you stop and help. And that's your, your, your that's your, your, you know, you got to live your faith. And so then you got to stop and help someone and uh, boom, they got you. The whole thing was, it was say it was just a trap just another trap you know that you're absolutely right they try to set up a urgency uh something that goes to your core belief system to get you to respond quickly and uh and then they laugh they mock you they mock you because you're weak they call that being weak caring for others is a weakness oh god so, so Terry, you and I, we could probably spin off and and have multiple oh, yeah. episodes talking about different things. Like what just popped in my head was regarding, you know, victims of domestic violence, or we, you know, or 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 the the same grooming that happens with domestic violence or or emotional abuse in a relationship and how. Because I was just reading something about a nar- you know, narcissism, who 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 they partner with and and yes. how they select individuals that will fit you know, and, and because they won't necessarily date or marry someone who doesn't fit that profile. Oh, right. Because, oh, yeah. well, that'd be too difficult. Sure. That's, that's why you have in the most dysfunctional relationships I've seen where criminal, you have a punch and Judy show going on all the time. And you're like, well, why doesn't Judy leave punch? Why, why doesn't punch leave Judy? Well, it's, 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 they're, they're, they're caught up. They're a mess. You know, and uh and it's hard it's hard to get out of there yeah it's hard to get out you gotta have a plan yeah you know? well and it and and because of that similar right you know to you know when they i remember early on learning if it seems to be too good to be true mm-hmm. then you should probably stick with that thought because it's probably not true 
but you know, it be, because Ke- because Kevin, you're not that lucky. Okay, That's it's just right. you, you're, you're just you, you just don't have that kind of luck, and it probably would help if you believed in luck. So, but um, yeah. this, this this idea that this is too good to be true, um, or I'm the I'm the I'm you know I'm the lucky one. Um, and if I if I can remember that, then maybe those fraudulent emails coming through, maybe mm-hmm. though, maybe maybe that uh, that one in a lifetime ch- opportunity, maybe right. maybe I'll just reject it at the very beginning, and and I won't have them come into my living room and, yep. and but check you'll out my house. Hit, you'll get hit again, and it, and it's nothing you're doing wrong. You will constantly get hit on, yeah. and it's just how it is now with the electronic stuff and. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, they don't communicate with each other just because I said no, no on Tuesday doesn't mean that I won't get a, get an opportunity to uh, get sucked in on Thursday. So, right. <laughs> so. It's just that frequent now. Yeah. So. It's just well, that frequent. Well, Terry, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I had some great, great feedback from individuals that uh, knew oh, wow. and, wor- and worked worked with you at Rockford and in different places, and so uh, it, it's and so that was that was fun uh, to to hear from people that you had touched their lives and and what of an impact, a positive impact you had on their lives. So. Hope. Is that listed somewhere or? Yeah, you can see some of some of the comments were like just on social media and on, on Facebook. You can you can see some of those comments uh, and some people that you would remember um, uh, from from when you were at RPS or at Oakwood and, and different things like that. So I, I was blessed. I, you know, so many times it, it's uh, I, my journey has been very uh, like the Princess Bride, that movie, the Princess Bride. Every time you think it's going to be, it turns out OK. Yeah. It yeah. just turns out okay. I don't know. I just, you know, till the day it doesn't. And yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So, really so so for the for the audio, for listeners that may not have listened to the first episode, what's the if someone wanted to reach out to you, what's what's the best way for them to get a hold of you to to learn or or some more resources regarding this or or just to say hi? Um, so oh my friends would uh my cell phone is still active. Okay. I've, I don't have my name on it. Yep. Yep. I have uh, dropped out, but my friends, you know, they all know each other. There's so many great lawyers that yep. they, they have my, it's my cell phone. Okay. Um, I shut down my PMB box. I, I live real quiet now. Gotcha. Well, the benefit of benefit of retiring, you know, in in northern Wisconsin. So, well, Terry, thank you very much for for everything that you do. And uh, we'll be in touch again and uh, get connected. And and if there's a a thought or an idea that you want to share with uh, or some work that you're doing, you want to share with with the audience, we will definitely have you back on. You're very kind. Okay, thank you. It was great talking with you, man. All right. We'll talk to you soon. So as we wrap it up, uh, again, from the from the work that uh, Dr. Lichtenwald has done throughout his entire life, and this is either you are finding yourself in a situation that you are, are believing that it's unsafe and and possibly even to the point where it could be either uh, some level of, of dangerous for you, you know, definitely reach out, definitely uh, don't act on that sense of urgency um, and and be able to pause before that you uh, before you act anything and then reach out to to someone that may be a good resource to 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 run those ideas by. Um, it is always going to um, it is not going to look like the stereotypical uh, bad guy in in the movies. The, this is very much uh, these as as Terry share, shared. These are individuals who are professionals at what they do, and that means that they're well practiced at what they do. So. Um, so definitely don't try to do this. Uh, uh, if you're suspecting something, make sure that you uh, then be able to bring that to someone who you can um, double check that with. So as always, thank you for being with us and I look forward to being with you next week.